Boy, Tales of Childhood, written by Roald Dahl. Captain Hardcastle. We called them masters in those days, not teachers, and at St. Peter's, the one I feared most of all, apart from the headmaster, was Captain Hardcastle. This man was slim and wiry, and he played football. On the football field, he wore white running shorts and white gym shoes and short white socks. His legs were as hard and thin as a ram's legs, and the skin around his calves was almost exactly the color of mutton fat. The hair on his head was not ginger. It was a brilliant dark vermilion like a ripe orange, and it was plastered back with immense quantities of brilliantine in the same fashion as the headmaster's. The parting in his hair was a white line straight down the middle of the scalp, so straight it could only have been made with a ruler. On either side of the parting, you could see the comb tracks running back through the greasy orange hair like little tram lines. Captain Hardcastle sported a mustache that was the same color as his hair. And oh, what a mustache it was. A truly terrifying sight. A thick orange hedge that sprouted and flourished between his nose and his upper lip and ran clear across his face from the middle of one cheek to the middle of the other. But this was not one of those nail-brushed mustaches all short and clipped and bristly, nor was it long and droopy in the walrus style. Instead, it was curled most splendidly upwards all the way along as though it had a permanent wave put into it, or possibly curling tongs heated in the morning over a tiny flame of methylated spirits. The only way he could have achieved this curling effect, we boys decided, was by prolonged upward brushing with a hard toothbrush in front of the looking glass every morning. Behind the mustache there lived an inflamed and savage face with a deeply corrugated brow that indicated a very limited intelligence. Life is a puzzlement, the corrugated brows seemed to be saying, and the world is a dangerous place. All men are enemies and small boys are insects that will turn and bite you if you don't get them first and squash them hard. Captain Hardcastle was never still. His orange head twitched and jerked perpetually from side to side in the most alarming fashion, and each twitch was accompanied by a little grunt that came out of the nostrils. He had been a soldier in the army in the Great War, and that, of course, was how he had received his title. But even small insects like us knew that Captain was not a very ex extolled rank, and only a man with little else to boast about would hang on to it in civilian life. It was bad enough to keep calling yourself Major after it was all over, but Captain was the bottoms. Rumor had it that the constant twitching and jerking and snorting was caused by something called shell shock. But we were never quite sure what that was. We took it to mean that an explosive object had gone off very close to him with such an enormous bug bang that it had made him jump high in the air and he hadn't stopped jumping since. For a reason that I could never probably understand, Captain Hardcastle had it in me for my very first day at St. Peter's. Perhaps it was because he taught Latin and I was no good at it. Perhaps it was because already, at the age of nine, I was very nearly as tall as he was, or even more likely, it was because I took an instant dislike to his giant orange mustache, and he often caught me staring at it with what was probably a little sneer under the nose. I had only to pass within ten feet of him in the corridor, and he would glare at me and shout, Hold yourself straight, boy. Pull your shoulders back, or take those hands out of your pockets. What's so funny, may I ask, are you smirking and what are you smirking at? or most insulting of all, you, what's your name? Get on with your work. I knew, therefore, that it was only a matter of time before the gallant captain nailed me good and proper. The crunch came during my second term when I was exactly nine and a half, and it happened during evening prep. Every weekday evening, the whole school would sit for one hour in the main hall between six and seven o'clock to do prep. The master on the duty for the week would be in charge of prep, which meant that he had sat high up on his days at the top end of the hall and kept order. Some masters read a book while taking prep and some corrected exercises, but not Captain Hardcastle. He would sit up there on the dais, twitching and grunting and never once would look down at his desk. His small milky blue eyes would rove the hall for a full 60 minutes, searching for trouble and heaven help the boy who caused it. The rules of prep were simple, but strict. You were forbidden to look up from your work. You were forbidden to talk. That was all there was to it but it left you precious little leeway in extreme circumstances, and I never knew what these were. You could put your hand up and wait until you were asked to speak, but you had better be awfully sure that the circumstances were extreme. 
Only twice during my four years at St. Peter's did I see a boy putting up his hand during prep. The first one went like this. Master, what is it? Boy, please, sir, may I be excused to go to the lavatory? Master, certainly not. You should have gone before. Boy, but sir, please, sir, I didn't want to before. I didn't know. Master, whose fault was that? Get on with your work. Boy, but sir, oh, sir, please, sir, just let me go. Master, one more word out of you and you'll be in trouble. Naturally, the wretched boy dirtied his pants, which caused a storm later on upstairs with the matron. On the second occasion, I remember clearly that it was a summer term, and the boy who put his hand up was called Braith Brothwaite. I also seem to recollect that the master was taking prep he was our friend, Captain Hardcastle, but I wouldn't swear to it. The dialogue went something like this. Master. Yes, what is it? Brothwaite. Please, sir, a wasp came in through the window, and it stung me on my lip, and it's swelling up. Master. A what? Brothwaite. A wasp, sir. Master. Speak up, boy, I can't hear you. A what came in through the window? Brothwaite. It's hard to speak up, sir, with my lip all swelling up. Master. With your what all swelling up? Are you trying to be funny? Brothwaite. No, sir. I promise I'm, I'm not, sir. Master. Talk properly, boy. What's the matter with you? Brothwaite. I told you, sir. I've been stung, to My lip is swelling, and it, it's hurting terribly. Master. Hurting terribly? What's hurting terribly? Brothwaite. My lip, sir. It's getting bigger and bigger. Master, what prep are you doing tonight? French verbs, sir. We have to write them out. Master, do you write with your lip? Brothwaite. No, sir, I don't, but you see. Master, all I see is that you are making an infernal noise and disturbing everyone in the room. Now get on with your work. They were tough, those masters. Make no mistake about it. And if you wanted to survive, you had to become pretty tough yourself. My own turn came, as I said, during my second term, and Captain Hardcastle was again taking prep. You should know that during prep, every boy in the hall sat at his own small individual wooden desk. These desks had the usual slopping wooden tops with a narrow flat strip at the far end where there was a groove to hold your pen and a small hole in the right-hand side in which the ink wall sat. The pens we used had detachable nibs, and it was necessary to dip your nib into the ink wall every six or seven seconds when you were writing. Ballpoint pens and felt pens had not been invented, not been invented, and fountain pens were forbidden. The nibs we we used were very fragile, and most boys kept a supply of new ones in a small box in their trouser pockets. Prep was in progress. Captain Hardcastle was sitting up on the dais in front of us, stroking his orange mustache, twitching his head, and grunting through his nose. His eyes roved the hall endlessly, searching for mischief. The only noises to be heard were Captain Hardcastle's little snorting grunts and the soft sound of pencil nibs moving over paper. Occasionally, there was a ping, as if somebody dipped his nib too violently into his tiny white porcelain inkwell. Disaster struck when I foolishly stubbed the tip of my nut nib into the top of my desk. The nib broke. I knew I hadn't got a spare in my pocket, but a broken nib was never accepted as an excuse for not finishing prep. We had been sent an essay to write, and the subject was The Life Story of a Penny. I still have that essay in my files. I made a decent start, and I was rattling along fine when I broke that nib. There was still another half hour of prep to go, and I couldn't sit there doing nothing all that time, nor could I put my hand up and tell Captain Hardcastle I had broken my nib. I simply did not dare. And as a matter of fact, I really wanted to finish that essay. I knew exactly what was going to happen to my penny th through the next two pages, and I couldn't bear to leave it unsaid. I glanced to my right. The boy next to me was called Dobson. He was the same age as me, nine and a half, and a nice fellow. Even now, six years later, I can still remember that Dobson's father was a doctor and that he had lived, as I had learned from the label on Dobson's truck box, at the Red House, Uxbrig, Middlesex. Dobson's desk was almost touching mine. I thought I would risk it. I kept my head lowered, but watched Captain Hardcastle very carefully. When I was fairly sure he was looking the other way, I put a hand in front of my mouth and whispered, Thompson, Thompson, could you lend me a nib? Suddenly, there was an explosion up on the day. 
Captain Hardcastle leapt to his feet and was pointing at me and shouting, You're talking! I saw you talking! Don't try to deny it! I distinctly saw you talking behind your hand. I sat there, frozen with terror. Every boy stopped working and looked up. Captain Hardcastle's face had gone from red to deep purple and he was twitching violently. Do you deny you were talking? He shouted. No, sir, no, but... but. And do you deny you were trying to cheat? Do you deny you were asking Dobson for help with your work? No, no, sir, I wasn't. I wasn't cheating. Of course you were cheating. Why else, may I ask, would you be speaking to Dobson? I take it you are not inquiring after his health. It is worth reminding the reader once again of my age. I was not a self-possessed lad of 14, nor was I 12 or even 10 years old. I was nine and a half, and at that age, one is ill-equipped to tackle a grown-up man with flaming orange hair and a violent temper. One can do little else but stutter. I, I have broken my nib, sir, I whispered. I, I was asking Dobson if he could, could, could lend me one, sir. You are lying, Captain Hardcastle said. And there was triumph in his voice. I always knew you were a liar and a cheat as well. All I w wanted was a nib, sir. I'd shut up if I were you, thundered the voice on the days. You'll only get yourself into deeper trouble. I am giving you a stripe. These were the words of doom. I am giving you a stripe. All around I could feel a kind of sympathy reaching out to me from every boy in the school, but nobody moved or made a sound. Here, I must explain the system of stars and stripes that we had at St. Peter's. Except for exceptionally good work, you could be awarded a quarter star. And a red dot was made with a crayon beside your name on the notice board. If you got four quarter stars, a red line was drawn through the four dots indicating that you had completed your star. For exceptionally poor work or bad behavior, you were given a stripe, and that automatically meant a thrashing from the headmaster. Every master had a book of quarter stars and a book of stripes, and these had to be filled in and signed and torn out exactly like checks from a checkbook. The quarter stars were pink, the stripes were fiendish, blue-green color. The boy who received a star or a stripe would pocket it until the following morning after prayers, when the headmaster would call upon anyone who had been given one or the other to come forward in front of the whole school and hand it in. Stripes were considered so dreadful that they were not given very often. In any one week, it was unusual for more than one, two or three boys to receive stripes. And now, Captain Hardcastle was giving one to me. Come here, he ordered. I got up from my desk and walked to the day. He already had his book of stripes on the desk and was filling one out. He was using red ink, and along the line where it said reason, he wrote, talking and prep, trying to cheat, and lying. He signed it and tore it out of the book. Then, taking plenty of time, he filled in the counterfoil. He picked up a terribly, terrible piece of green-blue paper and waved it in my direction, but he didn't look up. I took it out of his hand and walked back to my desk. The eyes of the whole school followed my progress. For the remainder of prep, I sat at my desk and did nothing. Having no nib, I was unable to write another word about the life story of a penny, but I was made to finish it the next afternoon instead of playing games. The following morning, as soon as prayers were over, the headmaster called for quarter stars and stripes. I was the only boy to go up. The assistant masters were sitting on the very bright, upright chairs at either side of the headmaster, and I caught a glimpse of Captain Harncastle, arms folded across his chest, head twitching, the milky blue eyes watching me intently the look of triumph still glimmering on his face. I handed him my stripe. The headmaster took it and read the writing. Come and see me in my study, he said, as soon as this is over. Five minutes later, walking on my toes and trembling terribly, I passed through the green be beige doors and entered the sacred precincts where the headmaster lived. I knocked on his study door. Enter! I turned the knob and went into his large square room with bookshelves and easy chairs and the gigantic desk topped in red leather straddling from the far corner. The headmaster was sitting behind the desk holding my stripe in his fingers. What have you got to say for yourself? He asked me, and the white shark's teeth flashed dangerously between his lips. I didn't lie, sir, I said. I promise I didn't, and I wasn't trying to cheat. Ch cheat. Captain Hardcastle says that you were doing both, the headmaster said. Are you calling Captain Hardcastle a liar? No, sir. Oh, no, sir. I wouldn't if I were you. I had broken my nib, sir, and I was asking Dobson if he could lend me another. That is not what Captain Hardcastle says. He says you were asking for help with your essay. Oh, no, sir, I wasn't. I was a long way away from Captain Hardcastle, 
and I was only whispering. I don't think you could have heard what I said, sir. So, are you calling him a liar? Oh, no, sir, no, sir, I would never do that. It was impossible for me to win against the headmaster. What I would like to have said is, yes, sir, if you really want to know, sir, I am calling he Captain Hardcastle a liar because that's what he is, but it was out of the question. I did, however, have one trump card left to play, or I thought I did. You could ask Dobson, sir, I whispered. Ask Dobson, he cried. Why should I ask Dobson? He would tell you what I said, sir. Captain Hardcastle is an officer and a gentleman, the headmaster said. He has told me what had happened. I hardly think it. I want to go around asking some silly little boy if Captain Hardcastle is speaking the truth. I kept silent. For talking and prep, the headmaster went on. For trying to cheat and for lying, I'm going to give you six strokes of the cane. He rose from his desk and crossed over to the corner cupboard on the opposite side of the study. He reached up and took up from the top of it three very thin yellow canes, each with the bent over handle at one end. For a very... For a few seconds, he held them in his hands, examining them with some care. Then he selected one and replaced the other two on the top of the cupboard. Bend over the cane again. I was frightened. There is no small boy in the world who wouldn't be. It wasn't simply an instrument for beating you. It was a weapon for wounding. It lacerated the skin. It caused severe black and scarlet bruising that took three weeks to disappear. And all the time during those three weeks, you could feel your heart beating along the wounds. I tried once more, my voice slightly hysterical now. I didn't do it, sir. I swear I'm telling the truth. Be quiet and bend over. Over there and touch your toes. Very slowly I bent over. Then I shut my eyes and braced myself for the first stroke. Crack! It was like a rifle shot with a very hard stroke of the cane on one's buttocks. The time lag before you feel any pain is about four seconds. Thus, the experienced cane caner will always pause between strokes to allow the agony to reach its peak. So for a few seconds after the first crack, I felt virtually nothing. Then suddenly came the frightful, searing, agonizing, unbearable burning across the buttocks. And as it reached its highest and most excruciating point, the second crack came down. I clutched hold of my ankles as tight as I could and I bit my lower lip. I was determined not to make a sound, for that would only give the executioner greater satisfaction. Crack! Five second pause. Another pause. Crack! Another pause. I was coming, counting the strokes, and on the sixth one hit me, I knew I was going to survive in silence. That will do, the voice said behind me. I straightened up and clutched my backside as hard as I could possibly could with both hands. This was always the instinct of an automatic reaction. The pain is so frightful, you try to grab hold of it and tear it away, and the tighter you squeeze, the more it helps. I did not look at the headmaster as I hopped across the thick red carpet towards the door. The door was closed and nobody was about to open it for me. So a couple, for a couple of seconds, I had to let go of my bottom with one hand to turn the knob. Then I was out and hopping around in the hallway of the private sanctum. Directly across the hall from the headmaster's study was assistant master's common room. They were all in there now, waiting to spread out to their respective classrooms. But what I couldn't help noticing, even in my agony, was that this door was open. Why was it open? Had it been left that way on purpose so that they could all hear more clearly the sound of the cane from across the hall? Of course it had. And I felt quite sure that it was Captain Hardcastle who had opened it. I pictured him standing in there among his colleagues, snorting with satisfaction at every single stroke. Small boys can be very comradely with the member of their community has gotten trouble, and even more so when they feel an injustice has been done. When I returned to the classroom, I was surrounded on all sides by sympathy, sympathetic faces and voices. But one particular incident had always stayed with me. A boy of my own age, called Hyten, was so violently incensed by the whole affair that he said to me before lunch that day, You don't have a father. I do. I am going to write to my father and tell him what has happened, and he'll do something about it. He couldn't do anything, I said. Oh, yes, he could, Hyten said. And what's more, he will. My father won't let them get away with this. Where is he now? He's in Greece, Hyten said. In Athens. But that won't make any difference. Then and there, little Hyten sat down and wrote to his, the father he admired so much. But of course, nothing came of it. It was nevertheless a touching and generosity, generous gesture from one small boy to another that I have never forgotten it.